16 free meals plus three free gifts with code AWFUL16. HelloFresh.com slash AWFUL16. Well, he's like, what tests have you performed? And she's like, all the ones that came up when the writer Googled psychiatric tests list. Right. <laughs> yeah. But also, like, also, sorry, a- Andrew, another legal question for you. Would you bring on a witness if the best thing that they could say about your client is, well, he's not a sociopath. I'm pretty sure <laughs> of that. <laughs> this, 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 this is will not matter for the future this. of this company, <laughs> Andrew. Answer carefully. <laughs> Awful movie. 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 Welcome back to the Gamcast, where each week we sample another selection from Christian cinema because we're subconsciously mad at our eyes. I'm your host, No Illusions. Heath will be unable to join us today, but sitting 900 miles to my northeast is my bad friend Eli Bosnick. Eli, how are you this fine afternoon, sir? Ah, uh, my testicles are the shape and size of a navel orange, no illusion. Yes, <laughs> yeah, you can say, like, hours since the vasectomy he's joining us here. Yeah. I told you yesterday that was a bad idea, but you didn't yeah. believe Noah me. Noah was like, hey, man, we got the show, you're fine. And I was like, I would never do that to you, Noah. I'll be fine. Yep. Just let me chug some opiates and let the <laughs> open wound that heals on my testicles guide my comedy. <laughs> If I start to scream, it may or may not be about the movie. So if this was an 18 epi- uh, minute episode when you downloaded it, at least you know now wh- <laughs> Now why you know why, right. That because be. I passed out. Yeah. All right. But also joining us, of course, is recurring guest masochist, host of the Opening Arguments podcast and cleanup on aisle 45, Andrew Torres. Andrew, welcome back. Thanks, Noah. Nothing like having open wound on my testicles be the uh, foreshadowing to yeah. have me come on. <laughs> it's great to be here. But honestly, if you had to choose between watching this movie, <laughs> <laughs> this movie is rather like sitting on your balls for an hour and a half. Yeah, so, yep, absolutely. Yeah. It there. is the open testicle wound of film. Yeah. So <laughs> tell us, Andrew, what will we be breaking down today? We watched The Trial. It's a uh, legal thriller for people who have no idea what the law is and routinely send back their oatmeal for being too spicy. <laughs> <laughs> No, don't I, they though i love the way that they just define basic legal terms for grandma every few oh, minutes of this one. yeah it's yeah. lovely and eli how bad was this movie well if you love the legal accuracy of an early jack reacher novel <laughs> but you have to write your movie with a team of health teachers staring at an abstinence only poster <laughs> you will love this movie honestly if you told me this movie was a skeleton script that the writers had meant to fill in later yeah. and accidentally sent to the studio i believe you even uh, even Two votes <laughs> down to the fucking title right the trial even that sounds like a placeholder name yeah i'm shocked no one was named john everyman in the script <laughs> right, so is there anything you guys want to nominate this one for being the best at being the worst at Oh, yeah. Uh, how about best worst god awful movie? Uh, okay, guys, like <laughs> I was lured here under false pretenses. This is very clearly a laud awful movie. There are like four times people say the word Jesus. That's it. So, <laughs> yeah, this movie was just like trying to, like, it was sort of an afterthought. Oh, we need one of those Dove preview ratings. Uh-huh. Gonna, mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and look, there's nothing I love more than throwing Heath under the bus when he's not here to defend himself. So, Andrew, yeah. can I tell you? I had planned for you to do The Devil's Reign, a William Shatner movie. What? With us. Yes. And then he saw that it was on the week he was off and he was like, no, no, do this one with Andrew, the one that's the trial with Andrew and I'll do the one (sighs) when I'm back. That explains because like a week ago when you asked me to come on the show, you were like, I have a doozy for you. And I understand you're on, you know, fistfuls of barbiturates right now, but (laughs) we were going to have a conversation (laughs) about what counts as a doozy. Yeah. 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 Oh. All right, so I have a weird best worst because it's not even in the movie. I'm going to go with best worst alphabetical cast list. <laughs> so to be fair to the movie, the, the credits list the cast alphabetically and fucking nail it by last name even. And it's not necessarily the filmmaker's fault that IMDb fucked it up, but 
As a, as a Facebook friend pointed out, the only alphabetical list is the little ellipses line in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, it, because it, it is clear, like Matthew Modine does not appear above the fold anywhere on the IMDb yep. page because of this. <laughs> and I think it is pretty obvious that he had his lawyer like send a cease and desist <laughs> notice that was like, if you imply that I am in any way, and they're like, but Mr. Modine, you're the star. No, I am not. <laughs> Right. Uh, this is Matthew Modine's P tape, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Once this right. gets out, he's gonna be like, All right, release some release some pictures of my dick or something. I don't <laughs> yeah, want this out yeah, here. Here I am steering a speedboat with my penis. That's yes. it. <laughs> uh. And I'm gonna take the easy one. I'm gonna go with best worst defendant. Oh my god. <laughs> okay. This so, fucking guy. Who's the guy who plays the bad lawyer? Because he plays the bad lawyer in every movie. Yeah, he's the warden from Shawshank Redemption. Yes, yeah. and he plays bad lawyer, bad authority figure in every fucking movie. He's been in a bunch of the ones we've reviewed. Yep. And I think, I I must assume, in an act of tiny rebellion, for the, for the entirety of this film, he will pronounce the word defendant as defendant. Yep. <laughs> in the loudest, clearest, most obvious way possible. Yeah, no, he'll he'll like pause the entire movie and go defend Dant, like Heath pronouncing Thursday. Right, like he was in a fight with their voice and speech coach <laughs> on the set. And he was like, oh, is that how they pronounce it? No, 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 I'll do it, I'll do it. Defend Dant, you like that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> if there's a clip of him somewhere going, in July, in July, <laughs> oh, that'd be spectacular. All right, well... I feel like everyone is sufficiently forewarned, so we're going to take a quick break. But when we come back, we're going to break down all the disjointed generic courtroom drama scenes that are The Trial. Hi, I'm Eli Bosnick, legal expert, here to tell you about all the ways that you can prank Mitch McConnell. Uh, Eli, what are you doing? You are not a legal expert. You are uh, the exact opposite of what a legal expert is. The nuisance. It, sure. What gives? Sorry, Andrew, but ever since I started learning from the best with Masterclass, I guess I just feel like I can learn anything. What's Masterclass? With Masterclass, you can learn from the world's best minds anytime, anywhere, and at your own pace. You can learn how to cook from Gordon Ramsay, improve your chess skills with Gary Kasparov, or learn comedy from Steve Martin. With over 100 classes from a range of world-class instructors, that thing you've always wanted to do is closer than you think. I don't know, Eli. Online classes, that seems like kind of a hassle. Not even a little. Masterclass works wherever you want to learn. So I can listen on the go like a podcast, watch it on my phone while I'm on the train, or even kick back and learn in the evenings on my smart TV. I highly recommend you check it out. Get unlimited access to every Masterclass. And as a God Awful Movies listener, you get 15% off an annual membership. Go to Masterclass dot com slash awful that's master class dot com slash awful for 15 percent off master class all right eli well master class sounds great but you are definitely not a legal expert no oh, so i probably shouldn't have sent out all those soup penises then huh uh, do you mean subpoenas i don't know do i oh, i really hope so <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody, thanks for coming. As you know, Dr. Wilson here is working on a test at the University on Memory, and he has asked us to write, truly, the most forgettable movie possible. A tall order to fill, but I think we can do it. So go ahead, hit me with a few ideas. Ooh, ooh, how about a forgettable romantic comedy? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, it, all it takes is one good performance, and we could have a hit on our hands. Mm, good point. All right, uh, action movie. Nah, way too risky. If some kid sees it, like, and it's his first action movie, he's going to think it's awesome. And then, boom, we just RoboCopped ourselves. Uh, is RoboCop not awesome? It is not awesome, no. Oh, I've got it. I've got it. A legal drama. Oh, that is perfect. Yeah, we'll, we'll just do all the stereotypes. You know, murder story, retired lawyer taking on one last case. One last yeah, case. Murderer, blah, blah, blah. Right, yeah, exactly. There'll be some money or so. Okay. Oh, and, and how about the bad guy could be a character that we don't meet until the literal last minute of the movie? That'd be perfect. Ah, oh, man, the professor's going to be so pleased with you guys. Great job. I, 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 I'm, I'm sorry. I'm still a little hung up. How is RoboCop not awesome? Thank you. You are a hundred years old. He oh. shoots a guy in the dick. Right in the Dead. dick. Through the chick's skirt. Uh, that is pretty cool. 
and we're back for the breakdown, and we're going to open up on an autumn morning at a lovely house by the lake. <laughs> we watch uh, Matthew Modine looking out over the water, feeling bad about what he did to Eleven. I, would imagine. <laughs> I feel like Matthew Modine is feeling bad about being in this movie, yeah. knowing that he's in Stranger Things. Well, he wasn't in Stranger Things at this point, so at this point, he had to feel like, okay, this is this is it, right? I'm retired, and I just don't know it yet. <laughs> I'm I'm sorry, scenery question. Like it, it's clear this is supposed to be you know rich lawyer's mansion by the lake, but then there's like eight seconds that pans over this like Ruth Langmore hollowed out boat thing on stocks. Like what the <laughs> fuck was that? Do we know? <laughs> they were setting the mood because he's hollowed out inside. Oh, Andrew, yeah. right. sure. Speaking of which, he's going to go inside and, and grab his suicide gun. So. <laughs> Trigger warning on on the necessity of suicide jokes. Yeah. Oh, man, Christian movies have a lot of people sitting there brooding with guns. Like, I always knew that reviewing, you know, 350 plus Christian movies would end up with us learning some, you know, broad things about Christian communities, like their views on alcohol and politics and gender. But the thing I never expected when we started this show was like, yeah, they sit there with guns pointed at their heads a lot. You guys, <laughs> a lot. And not just guns, but guns pointed at their heads, plus an open bottle of pills, plus I think if the camera had panned just a minute over, there'd be a scalpel. Like, th yeah, <laughs> this is this is the equivalent of wearing a "Hi, I'm suicidal" T-shirt in this movie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, also speaking of subtlety, there's this as they're panning across the room. There's this statue of Lady Justice with her scales, and it's got cobwebs all over it. Ah, this, this movie is a fucking Ben Garrison cartoon brought to film. Oh. One of the arms might as well break off as he's yeah, sitting right, there. Right, uh -huh. So he puts the gun to his, his head and he's like, I'm going to shoot myself in three, two, phone ring. Mm -hmm. So he goes to answer his phone, which is from 1876. I expected the fucking caller to say, Watson, come here. I need you. Right. <laughs> yeah, he does have an old timey phone. And he answers it and he's like, hello, how am I? Uh, not about to kill myself. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Are you about to kill yourself? <laughs> yeah. But he's being called down to the to the courtroom, so he can't kill himself yet. <laughs> so it, instead, he goes to see this judge who's called him in for a shift at lawyering? Yes! <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Andrew, is this... Can they make you lawyer when you're retired? <laughs> is there a lawyer draft that we're unaware <laughs> of? I, 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 so... Yes, like your friend. I mean, what? I, I don't want to be answering yes to this question anyway because this movie sucks and is horrible and gets everything wrong. But sometimes a judge will call you up and ask if you want to be added to you know the the pro bono rotation if you've if you've got some time to help the court out that sort of thing we will later learn this is the presiding judge in this case so no the judge does not go <laughs> shopping for the lawyer he would <laughs> like to like present to the defense in his courtroom <laughs> and also like there's a strong undertone here of like when Matthew Medina's like, I, I don't see why this has to be me. And the judge is like, well, you know, basically every other lawyer we have here in Dog Patch USA sucks. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> None of this is a murder trial. None of those uh, armatures can handle it. <laughs> <laughs> also, so, but you know what? You know what I want in a lawyer? A guy who's not even supposed to be here today, right? <laughs> That's what I want. Jesus. Oh, uh, I want a lawyer who's in his pajamas as he takes the job. <laughs> right. Right, but he's like, look, I can order you to do this. And I wrote in my notes, I'm like, sometimes we don't even need Andrew here to clarify the yeah, lawyer yeah, stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, oh, wait, did I just hear you don't need me here? Because I no. can go. <laughs> Sunk cost fallacy. Oh. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. And then he's like, yeah, the judge says, this is such a baffling line. He's like, you know, Mac, that's the character's name. There was a time when you'd have asked me to order you to do this. Uh <laughs> Like a sub dumb thing, right? Seems kinky, <laughs> Why, judge. That would have just—he would have volunteered, is what you mean. <laughs> so, but he agrees to go see the public defender that had to recuse himself in the case, apparently, and meet with the defendant. Oh yeah, this is. Hey, you got glasses. You must be the exposition yes, guy for right. this movie, right? <laughs> uh. Yes. So we go meet exposition Gene, who explains the. The basic facts of the case, there was a girl and she was murdered in a car and they found this guy with the car keys in his pocket nearby and all doped up and says he can't remember what happened. And again, 
I know it's just a little thing here, but Exposition Gene is the one who's conflicted out. He introduces, we will get to, the, you know, the nominal villain of the film as the special prosecutor. And I just want to be like, a special prosecutor is not an indicator that the prosecutor is very special, right? <laughs> it means that the original prosecutor was conflicted out, right? right? Not that the DA thought he was stupid and needed to bring in the A team. Oh, <laughs> God. Yeah, the indication in this movie is like, no, they called in a good prosecutor right. for this one. <laughs> Not our usual. And and the other thing is, Exposition Gene here is whipsawing so wildly between like, well, you know, they got the best out there, so we need you because you're the best. By the way, this case is completely unwinnable. Yes, and uh, right. might as well be represented by a rock. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's like, yeah, right. We We need somebody as good as you to... Except this plea deal, honestly, I think it's the right way to go. Yeah. Without talking to the client, reviewing nope. the file, conducting any discovery. Yeah, yeah he considers it. He considers it. So, okay. <sighs> so then we, we go to the prison to meet his prospective client. And of course, this is the skater kid, the main character from Hard Flip, <laughs> which we watched just a few weeks ago. I didn't know who it was right away. I knew I recognized him. So I had to go to IMDb and I learned this fun fact while I was trying to figure it out. This actor's past character lists include, but are not limited to, characters named Kip, Cooper, Ricky, Tucker, Scab, Dog Bowl, <laughs> Douchebag, and I shit you not, five different roles for different characters named Luke. Yeah, he looks like a Luke. <laughs> yeah. Clearly. But they go to see Pete is the character's name, and he doesn't want to do 25 years in jail, damn it. Yeah, I don't know why every terrible legal drama has to do this, but every legal drama has to have the moment where the guy's like, you should take the deal. It's a good offer. And he's like, but I didn't do it. And it's like, that's not how deals work or why deals are offered. <laughs> they don't have a secondary, but you didn't do it deal system. Well, but also like, I feel like that's the first thing you want to establish, right? So did you do it? Right? Like that does, I don't feel like that comes out later in the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, he he says he he does he doesn't remember what happened, but he knows he didn't do it because he's not a murderer and he loved her. Damn it! Yeah, I also love that when he's offering him the deal, he says it's twenty five years, which you may have noticed is shorter than life. And I wrote in my notes, that's why this guy's the best. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, on a, on the average, yeah. And he's like, "Is there anything I can get for you?" He's like, "Well, you know, I I could use some books from my apartment." Matthew Modine says, "Hey, man, make a list. I'll I'll go by and get them." I so wanted us to look at the list, and it's all goosebumps, right? <laughs> Just right. pop up or hardcore pornography, <laughs> <laughs> strangle monthly. Okay, oh, um, <laughs> wait a minute. Sure about that deal? <laughs> so, so okay. So so then we cut to Matthew Modine at a graveyard, reliving his tragic backstory a little bit more. And this is a genuine I'll be damned moment for me because we're about to meet his brother-in-law. Put a question mark in that one. But I thought the like splitting wood montage became a trope after Captain America and the Avengers. But this movie predates that by two years. So huh. there you go. The Avengers stole from this movie is what you're it, that's that is my legal opinion that uh, the Avengers is just the trial with some action scenes in it. it's that's what you said when we saw it together I remember in theater yeah. you were just like this is just the trial yeah. but instead of Captain America we get that guy Robert Forster, right? Yeah. He's been in everything. The memory that's most recent for me is, uh, you know, he's the he's the disappearer from Breaking Bad. Well, there you right. go. Right, yeah. yeah. He was the, the bail bondsman from Jackie Brown. That's how I know him. Oh, that's right. Yeah. We're going to move the two. Uh, yeah, there you go. That's right. <laughs> and I know him as the brother-in-law from the trial. So see, it's all <laughs> coming together. Yeah. And like every other actor he in this film, he is way too good for it. But so he is... I guess Max, former investigator and also his brother-in-law from his wife who died in a car accident tragically. And he's going to see him saying, hey, you know, they tried to call me out a lawyer retirement. I don't want to do it. But the guy, the, the defendant reminds me of my son. So I feel like I have to. Yeah. He never tells us why. So I, I guess we're... <laughs> I'm just going to have to assume his son had a proclivity. His nine-year-old son had a proclivity for roofing people. Well, right, because the guy's like 23 or something. And he's like, it reminds me a lot of my nine-year-old. Like, <laughs> so. He too liked books. Yeah, I guess. He also read Goosebumps. 
Now, so, and then he goes to leave, and Robert Forster's like, hold on, I got something for you. And he throws him a sausage biscuit. Oh, uh, a sack full of sausage biscuits. A sack biscuits. full of sausage um, biscuits. Like, we're the, do, were you predicting that he'd be by today, or do you generally have that? I carry a bag of sausage biscuits wherever I go so I can huck it at Matthew Modine if I see him. <laughs> I could go for some sausage biscuits. I'm with yeah, you. Absolutely. Absolutely. That would be way better than doing this show right now. So, okay. So then we get a quick scene where Matthew Bodine stops by Pete's apartment. This scene serves absolutely no function whatsoever. Uh, except for the like 1954 where he, he so this is a really the, this this white door that it focuses on it's weird and the camera angles weird and the shot is weird and Matthew Modine like reaches up to the little ledge above it and pulls the key down from that and I'm thinking that's not a great spot to have your key in 2010 let alone in 2010 when you're in prison yeah so, yeah I was <laughs> yeah. weird and okay, so on Monday, he goes back to the judge and he agrees that he'll be the lawyer. We have a plot after all. He does, though, he tells the judge, he's like, I need an advance so that I can hire a paralegal <laughs> and an investigator. And Andrew, you're already laughing at this one, huh? I, this was the first but not the only time when my blood vessels decided to send helpful little bubbles of oxygen through them in the event that maybe it can cause my, <laughs> my brain to shut down. So first... This is when we learned that the judge who brought in Matthew Modine is also going to be the presiding judge yes, in the uh -huh. case. Because, you know, why the fuck not? But also, Matthew Modine is like, hey, uh, can I get an advance on that to hire an assistant and open an office and yes. rent a fleet of cars? And, uh, <laughs> I'm like I, a masseuse. I, Actually, a masseuse would be nice. <laughs> I look like this is this is a you know better call Saul moment. Like you get six hundred bucks a throw for these kind of PD Ooh. appearances, right? Like you do not get enough to hire you know sassy young Aaron Gray waitress. So right, yeah. yeah. Really wanted the judge to be running a check cashing program. All right, well yeah. I can advance you the money, but then the next check will be reduced by forty five percent over forty five days. <laughs> So, okay, so, yeah, but so he's got to go get his assistant. So he goes to the restaurant where apparently she started working when he got depressed and shut down his law office, right? Yeah. yeah. This actress, unlike Robert Forster, you will recognize from nothing, but she's <laughs> she's super cute. She's got, like I said, a sort of young Aaron Gray about her. And, by the way, she was born in Waycross, Georgia. So Yes. Ooh. Yes, she was and raised in Blackshear, Georgia, which is where I went to high school. Um, and oh. I actually did recognize her from somewhere. It would been from my, high school? <laughs> well, yeah, from my little sister's birthday party. Yeah, actually, they were friends. No. Uh, yeah, no, I know this girl. I, I, I know her like at least well enough that it would be rude for me not to say anything if we ran into each other at a grocery store. And I'm, oh. I'm, I'm very happy for her. She's living her dream. That's awesome. You think she's a show listener? I, I I doubt that very much. I always I don't okay, know. phew, because otherwise I got a bunch of notes I got to do. Yeah, there's also this great moment where he's like, "Hey, do you want to come back and work for me?" And she says, "Am I getting paid?" I just wrote my notes. Yes, because I said, "Come work for me." Makes you wonder what Matthew Modine was doing to this poor woman before. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so she quits her job and agrees to be a, a sidekick for the rest of the movie, and then on his way out. Robert Forster shows up and he's like, all right, I'll be your investigator for the rest of the movie. And he's like, yeah, it would have been weird for us to get a known actor for such a minor role. Otherwise, <laughs> Andrew, do lawyers generally have an investigator? Right. Do you have Morgan like doing backflips through windows? And shit? <laughs> I, 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 Occasionally karate fighting henchmen. I, I mean, I can't stop her from doing that. And she's got, she I, was doing that already. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> she, she brought those skills with her to the law firm. <laughs> so. uh, yeah, no, instead we get, this is the Ocean's Eleven setup, right? Yes, like uh -huh. a, that they're all going to gather together, except that it's the Ocean's Eleven, but lawyering for making a law movie for people who have never seen or consumed any media about the law ever. Yes. Right? Like, it begins with like you the define mens rea for the audience and like right uh, wait but it's but it's even dumber than it's like define reasonable doubt for the audience uh, yeah incorrectly as it turns out yeah <laughs> <laughs> so so they set up yeah they set up to do some serious lawyering which means of course you put up some easels you get out your push pin 
and your yarn. <laughs> Which, can I just say, these actors are way too psyched about. I would say everyone does a pretty good job in this movie. It's terribly written, but the actors read these terrible lines pretty well. Yeah. Except for this scene where the actors are like, do you see, we're going to have like poster boards and there's going to be like a little pushpin thing over there. It's like a real set for a real movie. <laughs> yeah, Nikki Delos, the, the, the Mindy, the, the assistant, looks just way too happy to be in a real movie at this point. Mm. That's certainly what I got. So... I got breakfast at Crafty. It was free. Yeah. <laughs> breakfast. So, and there's all this weird shit that never comes back into the movie, right? He's like, oh, you know, we're going to need to write a press release. And she's like, well, my boyfriend can do it. And they're like, your boyfriend's a fucking idiot. You should do it. And- uh- I, did. I I would say that's a like false rabbit trail, except we will learn everything in this movie is a false. That's rabbit true. Trail. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. This is a mystery in in so much as the solution is missing until they decide to tell you at one point in this movie. Yeah. I You feel like there were notes back there of like, yeah, go back and put some foreshadowing in the script. And then people are like, no, that's way too much. That's to be a big mm-hmm. thing. They did a find and delete of put blank in the script. <laughs> so, so yeah, and there's also this weird moment where Robert Forster's like, well, I'm your investigator. Should I run down all the hundred witnesses on this witness list? And he's like, <laughs> no, nah, that seems like a whole fucking thing, right? Like a big <laughs> thing. Why would we want to do that? Yeah. <laughs> He's like, no, just just the ones that'll fit into the runtime, man. Yes. I, I literally <laughs> wrote just these two from the movie. Yeah, right. <laughs> So, oh, and then, of course, Mindy also explains that she knows a great shrink that can interview Pete, the defendant, and figure out if he's really like if he has real amnesia or if he's not competent to stand trial. No, no, you're struggling to finish that sentence because she never finishes that sentence because no one finishes that sentence because there should not be psychiatric (laughs) testimony. (laughs) Sorry, but apparently there will be. That's Mm -hmm. that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. So then we cut over to meet Dr. Anna Wilk, the psychiatrist that's going to, you know, muscle her way into this movie, apparently. <laughs> yeah. We meet her at a support group that she does for the exact kind of tragic backstory that Matthew Modine has. Weird. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Coincidentally Dead Kids Anonymous. Uh, <laughs> let's all just go around and say how dead our kids are. <laughs> yeah, uh, with... With praising Jesus. Yeah, we're yes. we are 18 and a half minutes in and yep. technically this movie checks that box. But this is the first time other than the fact that like his flashback to a funeral was in a church. This is the first yeah. time there's any hint of that. And it's the dumbest hint, right? Because this is the line she says, you know, the, the woman's talking about her dead kid grief. And the doctor says, well, you just have to allow God to take you at his pace. I'm like, what an impressively meaningless statement that is. <laughs> yeah. uh, but no, we're we're here to audition a uh, Christian McChristie lady, like to be an expert witness. And Matthew Modine says, I want you to interview my client to see if he is competent to stand trial. Now, look, if you have watched even a minute of of a decent, like not even a great law show. Like, you know, that's the bare minimum standard of can your client understand the proceedings and assist in his own defense, right? Like, or right. Are are they, uh, you know, uh, clinically unable to observe what's going on around? Like there there wouldn't be this hearing. Yeah. There's been no hint that whatsoever that he might meet that or it might fall short of that standard. Yeah. Yeah. He runs through all the silly, not actual legal movies diseases he's like i need to know if he has amnesia or if he's not competent to stand trial <laughs> or, or if he has multiple personality disorders or is a dragon oh. can you run through all of those <laughs> <laughs> yeah and she's like yeah no i'll i'll do that um by the way do you have any kind of grief that you want to talk about over here he's like do i have grief holy shit it's my whole personality actually <laughs> and i just want to point out this tiny moment because it's such a beautiful example of how sloppy and useless the writing is in this film at the end of this scene she goes and again keep in mind this never matters how fast do you need the report and he's like I don't know how long does it take and she's like okay yep. <laughs> <laughs> and then the fucking scene ends and then okay so now we're Robert Forster is going to go interview the the this movie's effort at comic relief. Oh God. Right. This poor guy was told to be comic relief and, and he just, he's just verbose, right? He just keeps talking about shit constantly as though if he talks long enough, he's bound to hit a joke eventually. 
<laughs> yeah, I wrote in my notes, I assume they hired this actor because they decided against hiring a giant wad of used chewing tobacco. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the problem is, is that they've already cast the judge and Robert Forster here as hillbillies. So mm. they want to say that this guy is a hillbilly for among hillbilly, right? So it's like, right. how do we establish that? Outdoor moonshot. Outdoor still. moonshot. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Outdoor <laughs> moonshot still. Oh, God. But yeah, we get it. Yeah. So this guy was driving his truck the night of the murder and he saw the the murdered girl's car go by and then another car chasing it and that other car scraped into his truck. Right. This is going to be important, except no, it isn't because nothing's ever going to be important. But Robert Forster will now spend the rest of the movie with a paint chip <laughs> from a purple oh, sedan. I, I, all right. All right. I, I, I'm i sorry. I've, I've been sitting on my hands and chewing the inside of my cheek. <sighs> Eli's been doing that for a totally different reason. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but look. This is literally the strangest scene in the movie because Robert Forster is attempting to establish the chain of custody here. Mm -hmm. I, I think, right? He's like, you see me flaking this paint off into this vial, right? But it does you no good because he's not a police lab. He's just right. a guy. Yes. And so there's there's no one to testify as to chain of custody, right? Like, So I'll give you an obvious example. Robert Forster could leave and swap that vial yeah, right. out for a totally different for vial any, in his yeah. car. Uh, counselor, who do you call as your expert witness? You're not going to fucking believe this. <laughs> <laughs> Guess who we had verify our paint chips? You remember that guy before who could barely speak, right? <laughs> Whose eyes roamed around like he was in the middle of a seizure? <laughs> yeah, well, we our guy showed him a paint chip in 1992, and he's our expert witness. Yeah. He's, he's going to come to the stand with a jug of moonshine. Just take a <laughs> sip. It'll Here, make judge, him happy. Judge, try okay? this out. Try this, judge. Uh, yeah. So, okay. So then Mac heads down to the morgue to find some more clues. Now, of course, like every person who's ever worked at a morgue in a cop movie or a courtroom drama will meet this guy while he's eating lunch. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Whose trope is this? How did this become so infectious that every morgue scene has a guy eating a big sloppy meatball sandwich <laughs> over a dead little girl every time? <laughs> Every time he's just like, oh, yeah, and then the bullet wound one second. I need to put more sauce on my skin. <laughs> <laughs> right. But it, but the, this guy explains to to Matthew Modine that the victim had a bunch of roofies in her system. And he's like, did the guy have roofies in his system, too? And the dude's like, why would he roofie both himself and her? I don't, I'll check, man. And again, Matthew Modine, like he's like. Please describe these roofies of which you spend. I'm yeah. like, you're a criminal defense lawyer in 2010. You know what fucking roofies right. are, okay? Thank Come you. on. Well, to be fair, it's very lucky that he does describe them because what he describes are <laughs> pills that will range from this film to sleepy time drugs to zombie mind control pills. <laughs> They're odorless, colorless liquid. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Uh-huh. It comes from Australia. Did you get your roofies from Q? <laughs> <laughs> and I shoot them into someone's drink out of this pen, Bob. <laughs> so, okay. So then we get a quick walk and talk between Mac and Robert Forrester, where he explains that there's a mystery purple car that they're going to need to find. And that'll, you know, help them with the case. Yeah. So, Okay. So now we, we head to the courthouse, We've got the whole gang there. The fucking Ten Commandments on the courthouse wall show up in the establishing shot. <laughs> At this point, I saw this and I was like, I had seen a lot of Andrew's notes and I was like, Ten Commandments, Andrew, it counts. It counts, Ten Commandments. <laughs> the fact that they're 35 feet tall does not make this more of a Christian movie. It just makes it more obtrusive, okay? I feel like it does. I feel like Ugh. it does. This is the first time, of course, that we meet opposing counsel. He is, uh, as I already mentioned, the Shawshank Redemption Warden. Yep. Or as I have him, slightly less punchable Lindsey Graham. Okay. <laughs> Fair. Fair. They have a little lawyerly shit talk between him and Matthew <sighs> Modine. Hey, <laughs> Go hey <ahead>. Andrew, <laughs> do, lawyers, do lawyers do a weird shit talk session before every <laughs> courtroom <laughs> I didn't know, but if we do, I tell you what we don't do is, hey, here's a legal word, so long as you ask me zero follow-up questions, please. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. You suck at lawyering. <laughs> 
so yeah, so so the judge shows up. We we're, we're starting the trial now, apparently. And there's this weird moment where, apropos of nothing, bad guy lawyer stands up and he goes, "Oh, just so you know, in case the stakes of the movie weren't clear, we'll be seeking the death penalty in this case." He might as well nod to a three piece orchestra so they they can go vum vum vum. <laughs> <laughs> and. and- what makes this again, although this is all there, there was not there was not a lawyer attached to the script that reviewed the script. This was all there was one planning meeting in which there was a guy with a whiteboard and they went around the room and were like, all right, everybody name law words you've yep. heard occasionally. Yeah. So the judge says, OK, we're here. And Matthew Modine says what we have are. Brady v. Maryland request, which oh, I, my ears perked up. That's a real thing. <laughs> that is where you as defense counsel request that the state turn over all exculpatory evidence, potentially exculpatory evidence in its possession. Really, really important when you're a defense lawyer. Unless, of course, you're in this court, at which point it is the cue to Lindsey Graham to start monologuing about seeking the death penalty, <laughs> which uh not exculpatory last time I checked. <laughs> Also, Andrew, just to clarify, because it's going to be very important for the movie, you have to turn over all evidence except for your super cool surprise evidence. Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you get to you preserve. Get, everyone everybody gets, gets three gets... surprises. <laughs> and an air horn, yeah. Um, so <laughs> Your evidence is named Hightower. You do not have to disclose it. Well, and then and then the two of them start arguing out the death penalty thing like right then and there. Right. He's like, I'm going to go yeah. for the death penalty. And Matthew Modine's like, that's ridiculous. And the judge is like, tell me more. Tell me more. <laughs> yeah. Do they do that in court? I really hope they do that in court. <laughs> I, I really wanted the stenographer to like stand up and look around and go, guys, this is a status hearing. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> so. But by the way, the reason that he gives, he's actually going for the death penalty because he's mad at Matthew Modine. Yep. Not an awesome lawyer move. But the reason <laughs> he gives is that it's kidnapping and murder because if you murder someone, they didn't want to be where you were kidnapping. Yep. <laughs> Look, that that excuse works if you have a poor black defendant, right? Like that, well, that's, that's true. I'm, yeah. I'm not, and I know that's a little bit of a lot, but like that's true. Like the death penalty is not administered in any way that is consistent with it being a uh, only the most heinous crimes. They will look for kind of bizarre aggravating factors and I, I have seen cases like that where it's like, yeah, well it was kidnapping and murder and you're like, Right, but the kidnapping was the murder, and yeah, right, right. Mm-hmm. But the the point is, we can all be pleased because you know, <laughs> blonde haired, blue eyed kids like they never ever get the death penalty. Not with a sexy chin like his. No, no, uh, no. no not, but not douchebag here. There is a <laughs> yeah, not dog bowl. <laughs> that guy looks like he could play at least four Luke's. What are you talking about? <laughs> at least. <laughs> so yeah, but then so then the judge stops and just sort of explains to the lawyers conceptually what a (laughs) trial is. (laughs) Hello, gentlemen. Just a quick reminder. We will be doing the talky talks. There'll be a box (laughs) full of people over there, and then the movie will be over. (laughs) All right. Well, I believe Andrew needs a minute to breathe into a paper bag, so we're going to pause for another quick break. But when we come back, we'll be breaking down even more of the trial. Uh, yeah, I, I understand that. Well, look, my client doesn't own the goat, so we, no, he hasn't told me who does. All right. Uh, hold, hold on one second. Uh, someone's in my office. Andrew. Gentlemen, come in. Gift. I got you a gift. A, a DVD copy of Bullet to the Head starring Sylvester Stallone. Thank you. Yeah, it doesn't have a disc in it, but I figured you could store like your flat circles in there. Sure. I I appreciate it. Uh, look, how can I help you guys? Well, Eli's getting sued again. Again? If this is about the goat, I just hung up on. No, 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 no. It's it's Universal Studios. They're, they're suing him for copyright infringement on the Wolfman. Yeah, I guess my beard got a little out of control. Yeah. Of, yeah. Look, you look like you're going to sell somebody a map to Curly's gold, dude. Yeah, a little bit. He's he's right. You do. So, Eli, I don't understand. Why don't you just try Harry's razors? What are... Harry's razors. With their incredibly sharp razors and refills that arrive in the nick of time, Harry's is the official sponsor of Cutting It Close. 
Wait, I can get razors delivered to my house? Oh, not just razors, Eli. Right now, you can get a Harry's starter set for just $3. Plus, you'll get a free travel size body wash. The, the set includes a five-blade razor, the weighted handle, foaming shave gel, and a travel cover. That's a $16 value for just 3 bucks. Visit harrys.com slash awful. Wow, that's incredible. It sure is. And their refill packs are as low as $2 each and delivered right to your door, so you can stop spending money on razors that are overpriced by design. Harry's sent us a sample kit to try, and I was so impressed, I became a customer. Yeah, no matter how busy things get, stay fresh with Harry's. Grab your Harry's starter set today, and you'll also get a free travel size body wash. Just go to harrys.com slash awful. That's H-A-R-R-Y-S dot com slash A-W-F-U-L. Nice. So, Andrew, do you think I've got a case? I don't know. Does this have anything to do with you buying Benicio Del Roro.com from earlier this week? Maybe. I'll make some calls. Counselor, I think it would be in your best interest to take my offer. 15 years isn't bad. Well, I understand where you're coming from, but uh, I'm afraid we'll have to decline. Very well. Well, you leave me no choice. We'll be asking the judge... For the death penalty. For stealing a moped. Yeah, uh uh-huh. If you want to play hardball, then we'll play hardball. That's not hardball. That's murdering someone in a fit of pique. That's hardball. Look, counselor, why why don't we talk this over through lunch, right? Do you you like tacos? There's there's an awesome Mexican place nearby. I I prefer the Chinese place down the street. Oh, yeah, not a fan. Do you mind tacos? Only if you allow me to order the death penalty from the taco place. You know what? It's fine. Let's do Chinese. Hardball. Still not hardball. No, I work, though. (laughs) And we're back for more of this shit. We're going to rejoin the action with Robert Forster interviewing one of the victim's friends about some very suspicious clues that she left behind. (laughs) This is the weirdest, most contrived shit because they have to introduce these two letters that the victim wrote before she died. And they have like her friends like, well, she had to compose them on my computer and then save them there. And I still have them and printed them out for you. (laughs) It took this entire scene for me to realize that that's what they they said. You know, the the victim sent this letter from your computer. This movie is from 2010, right? Like, we all thought, oh, that meant she sent an email from your computer. But no, they mean printed out, (laughs) handed to her to put in an envelope to go mail at a post office like it's the fucking 17th century. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, that's and that was the best way that the fucking writer of this movie could come up with. And there were letters that they found. I, that's all. And oh, never minding the ultimate purpose. But uh, yeah. yeah. And also this scene, the first two minutes of it involved the roommate speaking in vague pronouns. Like, uh, well, you know, the script writers told me I would sound more mysterious if I, like, right. there were no pronoun antecedents <laughs> to anything. Yes. Ugh. But what we learn here, though, is that the victim's uncle was all creepy and pervy with her. Right. And she had sent a letter to him telling him to stop doing that. Yeah. And I, I wrote my notes. Mm, I don't know. I feel like a Christian audience is going to be torn about whether or not your uncle has a right to fuck you. Oh, Jesus <laughs> <Christ>. <laughs> Might be barking up the wrong tree with this one, Modine. Yeah, so, all right. So then we cut to bad guy lawyer. And I love this because they're like, what do sinister lawyers do? Well, they probably practice golfing in front of very large hotels (laughs) (laughs) also this movie and this scene is one of the there's a there's a later scene in which he's got a car and a driver they are playing lindsey graham like he's the senior partner at a private law firm and not you know a fucking civil servant in dog patch usa right but andrew andrew he's a special prosecutor (laughs) (laughs) he's not like one of those normal prosecutors he's a special one Robert Mueller is chauffeured everywhere he yeah, goes. Of course, they, of they have litter bearers to roll out a red carpet. Yeah. Also, can I just say, I love right at the very center of my vision board now is to have an assistant stand there while I do my hobby like an <laughs> asshole. <laughs> just me practicing magic tricks. Oh, and another thing, mac and cheese for dinner tonight. Yeah. 
Right, right. So, yeah, he's doing his golfing. He's got his assistant there. This scene is so fucking useless, too, because all that happens is his assistant gives us a like gives him a series of expository facts about Matthew Modine's character that we already got from the flashbacks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. And then and then it wraps up with the fucking Warden McBad lawyer saying, oh, you know, well, Matthew Modine then is a lawyer with nothing to lose. That makes him dangerous. I, I, d- what could that possibly mean? <sighs> Don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> so, I got a lot to lose. My son goes off to college tomorrow. Oh, literally tomorrow. Oh, we really? get on a plane. Oh. Yeah. Oh. I'm so sorry I made you spend the last week with him doing this. At some point, you had to be like, hey, son, who's leaving in a couple of days. I'd love to treasure our time together, but I have to watch Matthew Modine read lines off of his hand while eating while eating a fucking Cinnabon with his fingers. <laughs> I, Alex was like, that. this is not the third strangest Eli thing you've told me this yeah, week. Well, that's, so it's yeah, fine, it's man. fair. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So now it's time for Anne the Shrink to interview Pete and see if he's competent to stand trial. <sighs> hey, Pete. Hello. Yep. He's yep that it. Yep, there he go. seems to know that I'm here and everything. Charging you for the full hour. <laughs> <laughs> well, and they can't think of any words for her to say to him. So we just watch Matthew Modine watch them through a little window and then cut straight to the post interview assessment. Yeah which they're apparently going to do standing out in the rain, even though they just walked out of a room with a ceiling. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. And she explains that he's depressed and he's like, why do you think that is? And she's like, Oh, cause of the girlfriend murder and the the trial. (laughs) Probably. Why wouldn't he be depressed? So she's like, yeah, he could totally be fake in the amnesia thing though. And he's like, could be. And she's like, yep, that's what you get for your money with me. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And she's like, oh, by the way, did you have him tested for roofies as well? And he's like, yeah, we're waiting for the reveal on that one. We don't have much. It's uh... <laughs> So then we get Matt goes to meet with Robert Forster, who has decided that he's just going to loudly eat his way through this scene. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. Why? The apple. I've never heard a wetter apple. How did an apple... <laughs> So and and it's 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 almost like Robert Forster's like realized how bad this movie was. He's like, you know what? Fuck it. I am not missing my snack for this. I'm <laughs> <laughs> this delicious gala apple crunch. <laughs> so and then of course Mindy tells him at this point she's like, you should really get a cell phone, Matthew Modine. And he's like, oh, weird that we would be establishing now that I don't have one, but I guess necessary. She's like, yep, sure <laughs> is. So then. Mac and Bob Forster go to the jail to ask Pete about this uncle guy, right? And they're like, yeah, no, don't worry, man. Good news. Turns out your girlfriend's uncle was trying to fuck her. <laughs> so, huh? <laughs> are, you ha- are you still depressed? Did that cure your depression? <laughs> yeah. Oh, and then, of course, Pete has to meet with the bad guy psychiatrist as well right here. And this is important because this character will be inexplicably central to the entire goddamn story later. The psychiatrist. There could not be a less relevant character to be central to the story unless Chaw fucking Moonshine guy turned out to be the murderer. (laughs) I'm down for that movie. Right. That would be a twist I wasn't expecting. Yeah. All right. So now Mac walks in to get some lunch somewhere. And wouldn't you know it, Christian psychiatrist love interest lady happens to be right at that restaurant getting lunch with her son. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So she calls him over with the, you know, Christian salutation of Mr. McLean, right? Which drives on the fact that his name is Mac McLean in this movie. We're going to continue to call him Matthew Modine because we, unlike this movie, realize 20 years after Die Hard, you cannot name your protagonist McLean. No. Nope. No, you not cannot. unless he's going to have to crawl through air ducts at some yeah. point in the film. Thank you. Spoiler Matthew Modine does not crawl through no, any he air doesn't. ducts in this no. film. No. So, yeah, so he has a, this very charming moment with her kid, which is, I mean, if you've, once you've watched Stranger Things, watching him interact with children, you can't buy the whole, you know, he, he's a good dad thing. But that's what they're trying to sell, you know. Yeah, he's like, hello, I noticed you're alive. I had a son. <laughs> My son who liked peanuts. was alive. He's dead because of the death. Doesn't like peanuts anymore. Doesn't like anything. 
<laughs> what's so funny, again, this is the sloppy writing in the movie. What's supposed to be written into the movie is, honey, why don't you go check out the dessert thing? Because we've got to talk about the trial. But the way it reads is, my son is in the void. Maybe he's screaming. Maybe his consciousness just, you know, vanished like the flame of a candle. <laughs> hey, kiddo, why don't you check out the desserts? I'm sorry. <laughs> Matt Modine seems to be having a fucking meltdown in front of you. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> uh, so and so yeah. While the kid's checking out the desserts, he tells her he's like, "So yeah, it turns out he didn't have roofies in his system, so that's not the plot." She's like, "Did you try GHB?" He's like, "Did I try it?" <laughs> <laughs> I know. Like, how does I feel like she's just listing out like party drugs she enjoyed in college? Yeah, right. Have you tried Molly? <laughs> yeah, Mad Dog Twenty Twenty. I used to crush that. <laughs> All right, hear me out. You take Sprite. And you take codeine coughs. It's got to be codeine coughs. And you cook it down till it gets sticky. That's when you start stirring the Sprite in. But you got to do low heat or you're going to blow up your house. I'm sorry. Are we testing him for don't, this? No, I was just... Don't do that. I feel like I should probably beep some of that out, shouldn't I, Andrew? <laughs> Why? Why? We can't give fun recipes to our audience. <laughs> if I was doing a meatloaf recipe, you wouldn't stop me. <laughs> so take a cooler empty some packs of kool-aid in the bottom yeah thank you <laughs> so, okay all right moving on andrew's on board yeah right how are you encouraging him <laughs> so okay so w now we're back we're having another team meeting on team good lawyer and robert forster's going to give us some more paint chip info and i love this so goddamn much because he sets down his paint chip and he goes i got it back from the lab that is from a mid-90s sedan i how would they know it was paint from a sedan? <laughs> what? I, like I just they, they use the same paint on sports coupes and hatchbacks, do they not? Plus, if you need to establish that it's a sedan, which by the way, the fucking movie doesn't, we have witness that saw it. Yeah, right. <laughs> we already knew it was a mid '90s sedan based on the guy's description. This is no new information, and yet. Fucking Matthew Modine turns to Mindy and says, Mindy, call the DMV and see if they can find a match for a mid 90s sedan. Yeah, man, I feel like they'll have plenty of those. <laughs> Hello, uh, DMV. Yes, I would like all of your cars. <laughs> can you send those? I on? believe it was a Toyota Corolla. Have you had a Corolla? <laughs> One of those. Yeah. Ah. So, yeah, so, but we established that, that it's, it's like the movie is just going like, don't forget the paint chip, guys. Paint chip equals clue. Yeah. And then we, we learn about, so the uncle, the pervy uncle is named Spencer Hightower. So, Jim McBad guy. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm not insane that, that this is the first time we hear that name, right? Because yes. everybody else in the movie uses it like, oh, you know, Spencer Hightower, whom you met extensively in Act One. And I'm like, I, did I fall through the Twilight Zone? Okay, good. Right. Yeah. It's what they're going for is like, these are the richy riches in town, except they haven't established that. So they think we live in the town. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody knows the house. That towers, they own the hoots mill. Yes. <laughs> no, exactly. It's it's um people talking to you about their work, the movie. Right. <laughs> but yeah, so but Bob is tailing Spencer Hightower now. Yeah. And Mindy is trying to get the records about the Hightower Trust, the financial records. Okay. She goes to the bank, right? And you see her like, tuck, tuck, and the manager comes over and says, what seems to be the problem? And she's like, I have a warrant for these financial records. And he's like, yeah, obviously we will give you those. <laughs> what was the conversation that happened between her and the front desk guy? Why was he ready to die for the hot <laughs> <telephone? laughs> I will give you shit, you fucking pig. <laughs> also, what, like th this will turn out to be relevant to the movie later, right? But there's no reason for them to believe that it is. Like, oh, we think the uncle might be guilty. See what he's doing with his money. What? The, those letters did not imply that he was, you know, blackmailing nope. the victim. Or, no, they implied fucking. That was it. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> also, I'd like all his golf scores. It's a trial. <laughs> You're just allowed to collect information on people. Oh, there's this great moment too. Like that night, he's hanging out with Mindy, and they get the um the bad guy shrinks report, and they're like, "Yeah, the bad guy doesn't think that he's a good person at all. They believe that he's a sociopath with homicidal tendencies." So I'm like, "I don't think, 
I, don't, I think that's beyond his remit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, this is literally the carjacker Willie. Like, well, I'm going to I'm going to allow it on the fact that it uh, characterizes the victim and the uh, witness as a carjacker. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so he needs to talk to Dr. Wilkes stat. So and then we, we check in with bad guy lawyer briefly. He's still evil. Yeah. But then Matthew Motine goes to see Anne, the, the psychiatrist. She's in the yard trying to teach her son to throw a baseball, but she's a lady. <laughs> right? So she can't do that because of right. the vagina. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Foghorn Leghorn cartoon. Right? Like, oh, yeah, she is, is oh, literally shit. reading from a book here. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh. And by the way, that kid knows how to throw just fucking fine. Well, obviously. Uh, yeah, right. She's got the how to throw book out. She's reading to uh, him. From. I love that they didn't bother to look up anything about throwing a baseball. So he's like, no, 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 it's not that. You got to twist with your hips and aim for the clitoris. I don't know. Just <laughs> this. We're bonding. He doesn't He doesn't say anything, right? Because like, so the way this scene is supposed to play out, she's trying to teach the kid how to throw a baseball, but she doesn't know because she's a lady. So he comes in and he's supposed to know exactly how to, how to do it because he's a man. But the writer of the movie can't think of anything for him to say. So he just says, let me see your fastball. That was good. <laughs> Which, to be fair, like like Andrew said, the kid obviously already knows how to throw a fucking baseball. <laughs> so I guess that's all that was needed. Also, weird moment. Matthew Modine is like, hey, do you have another glove so that we can pick catch it? And the kid is like, oh, yeah, I keep my uh, dead dad's baseball glove in my backpack at all times. How right. nice of you to ask. Yeah. He's dead. Yeah. He's like, do you want to play catch with me with my dead dad's glove? You could be <laughs> like him and I could be like your dead kid. <laughs> do you think your wife and my dad are fucking, you know, like in heaven, how you <laughs> and my mom are about to be? <laughs> <sighs> yeah oh and and so we cut from this scene for just a quick second to warden mcbad lawyer meeting with the evil mr hightower not the uncle but the dad the the victim's dad yeah in his mahogany room <laughs> he's having an he's having an old fashioned at 10 a.m in a golf club which All this right. movie thinks is ominous and i think is sad <laughs> All right. Uh, and I think both of you are a little judgy. There, okay? <laughs> so, yeah, he's like, so how are things going? And he's like, oh, we're well into act two at this point. And the guy's like, that is the whole purpose of this scene. He's like, curiously, it is. Yes. Continue to lawyer. Yep. yep I was going to do that. Thank you. Do a good job or you'll go back to being a regular prosecutor. <laughs> <laughs> to moot you. So then we cut back to her house, to Anne's house, where Matthew Modine is, is still not talking about anything related to the case. Actually, now they're talking about her tragic backstory. Why? Why did they add this piece of flavor? It is the silliest, craziest piece of flavor you could add into the movie. For no reason. And apropos of nothing, she's like, yeah, no, my husband didn't just die. He killed himself. Anyway, what were you saying? Yeah, about that this will drive? never come up again in any way. <laughs> so no relevance whatsoever. I really wanted Modine to be like, "Ooh, how do you do it?" Because I've been. Um, <laughs> it doesn't <laughs> was matter. It pills? Just, uh, was it a gun? Is it how did how did it work right away? <laughs> so, <laughs> so okay, so we cut back to the courtroom. There's this great moment now where um, Matthew Modine and Warden McBad lawyer are in the metal detector line together. Oh my god, that's so good. Yeah, because the bad guy lawyer's just talking shit from behind him the whole time. <laughs> Andrew, we have to do this. We have to do this. <laughs> What's up, you... I, I hate to tell you this, but like when, when you are an attorney admitted to practice in a particular court, you have your little card, you get to skip the plea blind. So. Oh, oh, damn it. That fucks up all our plans. Well, when do you mumble your smack talk into the other guy's <laughs> ear? Oh, all, every other moment. Right? Oh, that's, okay. That's right. basically all a trial is. It's, it's, you know, <laughs> the moments in between mumbling smack talk to Lindsey Graham. The yeah. smack talk is so weird. He says at one point to Matthew Modine, you're going down with the ship. Yeah, at which point would have been a perfect time for Matthew Modine to come back and be like, I don't think you understand how the death penalty works. <laughs> <laughs> That would have been a good comeback. Oh, you know, if we end up doing trial by combat, I'll fucking kick the shit out of you. Okay, man. 
He goes, well, just so you know, the plea deal is off the table now. He's like, we already didn't take it. He's like, right. So I guess that's that's pretty hollow. The trial <laughs> began already. Right. I forgot. <laughs> I told you I'm a very special prosecutor. <laughs> so, okay. Time for the opening statements. And, and of course, we start with Warden McBad lawyer, who works into his opening statement how hot the victim was. <laughs> okay. It's a little weird. Let me be clear about what he says and what he implies. He says this trial is necessary because a beautiful woman is dead, which means that if she were an uggo, like, we yeah, could have right. skipped this be like whole We wouldn't thing. have a whole jury or anything. We would have pled it down. <laughs> We would have been like, this seems best for everybody and just sort of put a white handkerchief in the window of the car and walked away. You know how it works. <laughs> so, and this is, of course, where we first meet the weird, bizarre-ass fucking pronunciation of defendant mm -hmm. that Eli was talking about <laughs> at the beginning, right? Yeah, I could not. Uh, you guys are going to have to do jokes for almost every other scene in the movie because all of my notes for the rest of this film are defendant, defendant, <laughs> <laughs> defendant, the defendant over there. I will show that the defendant did, in fact, murder this woman on the night that the defendant did take her out and give her <laughs> drugs. And yeah, just for five fucking minutes. I wanted towards the end of the movie for him to just be like, my client. Okay, so you're doing it on purpose. All right. <laughs> so, yeah, so he finishes up his weirdly emphasized opening statement, and then Mac gets his turn, and, and he starts off with, like, I like you guys way better than that asshole over there <laughs> does. He goes, ladies and gentlemen, Murder is very serious. And I wanted so badly for it to cut to the jury. Clown juror just stands up and walks out. <laughs> no, oh, in that case, he goes, the book of Proverbs says that this movie desperately needs to qualify for a dove rating. Christian so. movie, Andrew. <laughs> Yeah, I was like, yeah, the book of Proverbs says a lot of things. Let's talk about the size of her a lover's emission. Yeah, <laughs> oh, God. So, and then we cut straight to the first witness, and this is a, highly unusual, as I understand it, for for trial lawyers. He's going to start with his surprise witness, going to use that mm. right away. <laughs> yeah, usually you save those. Yeah, I feel like you'd save that for the for the end of the trial, but no, he opens on a surprise witness. My note is here just, okay, yeah, so nobody involved with this movie in any way whatsoever. That's like hundreds of people, right, knows that. The other side gets the witness list. Do we establish that earlier in the movie? Sorry. Yeah. yeah. We had a moment where it was like, make sure you give him all your evidence. And he was like, I absolutely will. And he was like, surprise witness, surprise witness. And I will say this. We've seen a lot of surprise witnesses over years. This is the first surprise witness I've ever seen holding surprise evidence. Yes. <laughs> He's a double surprise witness. And, oh, and, and the music sting on this is so good, right? He's like, my first witness will be Lieutenant Moreau of the Marine Corps. And we do this hilariously over the top orchestra sting and dramatic zoom in on Pete going, oh, fuck, <laughs> not Lieutenant Monroe of the U.S. Marines. I really wanted Matthew Modine to lean into camera and be like, who's that? We haven't we don't know who that is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yeah, but it turns out that Pete was discharged from the Marines for roofing some other lady back in the day. So that's what surprise Lieutenant Monroe is here to establish. The question to elucidate this evidence is, oh, wasn't he drummed out of the Marines for prior similar conduct? And I'm writing prior similar conduct as murder. What? And then, <laughs> the, the, but no, they really are going with the carjacker Willie thing, right? They're like, <laughs> yes, yes see? he's the kind of person who gives roofies to people all the time. Like this is precisely, this is literally the kind of evidence you cannot admit at trial, right? Like, so you can, if it's a, you know, serial killer with a signature, right? But like saying this is the type of person who routinely administers rohypnol to people. So therefore, he probably administered rohypnol here is the inference you cannot ask the jury to draw, right? Right. And it's amazing that Pete didn't bother to mention this to his lawyer. Yeah. He oh. wasn't like, oh, and you know what? Another thing that's crazy about this murder trial, this is actually the <laughs> second time I've been falsely accused of roofing people. <laughs> I don't know what I got to stay away from roofies, I guess, because me and them, there's oil and water. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird. 
Uh, but yeah, so but that that takes place in the courtroom, and then we get this scene where he's like, his lawyer has to chew him out for not having mentioned that, and I'm like, yeah, no, that's fair. You give you give your lawyer a heads up on those. <laughs> yeah, no, that is it. That is immediately preceded. I'm sorry, just I, I have to to vet more by Matthew Modine standing up for cross examination and saying, no, no questions at this time. You're on. No, that means no questions, asshole. Like you don't you don't get to come back and be like, I might think of some a week from now. Like you're either prepared or you're not. Yeah, sorry. Well, what if I want to use him as my surprise witness too? <laughs> Ah, uh, would would the jury be willing to put a mustache on this witness and come back and say the opposite things from my side tomorrow? <laughs> well, that almost happens, it right? Does. Yeah, yep. actually, you're right. <sighs> so, okay, so then we we get the the toxicology guy the, who was eating the sub sandwich earlier. It's so good. <laughs> the ad for GHB. You mean the advertisement for GHB? Yes. Yeah, he goes. Uh, did the defendant have? Roofie's in his system. He's like, no, your witness. And he's like, how about GHB? And the guy's like, yep, sure had that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and special prosecutor guy is like, damn, I should have asked about any other substance. <laughs> I, so, all right. Both sides here are just asking. Like, like, usually the problem in law movies is that both sides will ask leading questions, right? You'll get the leading question. Isn't it true of your own witness on, mm -hmm. you know, on direct? But here, both sides are just asking wild, open-ended questions with no follow-up. So that's what makes this possible for Matthew Bodine is like, oh, hey, did you test for other stuff? Uh, yeah, I did. Did you test for GHB? Yep, I did. And uh, 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 he was positive for GHB. And at this point, the movie is fucking over. Your witness <laughs> has testified that the criminal defendant was helpless at the time the murder was committed. Right. Yeah. Like, I feel like this is a let's adjourn this movie and go home now. Right. Right. <laughs> Right. No, but we're we're going to continue under the aspect that he apparently did a a sleep murder. <laughs> so, I, and never revisit that at all. Yeah. So, OK. So, like, I guess it's that evening or the next day or whatever. We get Mindy. She's on to something. It turns out that Robert Forster got a picture of the Hightower guy going to see the psychiatrist guy at some point during his investigation. Why would any of this matter to them? Well, you have to have watched the whole movie for that to make any sense <laughs> you at all. You have to have written the script for this movie. <laughs> we've, we've read ahead. So. Yeah, right, right. So, okay. So now we're, we're back in court and that psychiatrist is on the stand. And so we get the cross-examination of that psychiatrist where he's like, hey, why was Spencer Hightower walking into your office and what the hell does this have to do with the plot? Yeah, yeah, can we get an objection? Who the fuck is Spencer Hightower? Right, from yes. Anyone? <laughs> I'll say it. You can dub me in via ADR. Uh. But don't worry, it's the dumbest possible connection. <laughs> the psychiatrist <laughs> is also Spencer Hightower's financial advisor. <laughs> He's a psychiatrist I, slash financial advisor. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I I I manage 401k's on the weekends. What can I say? <laughs> I, this is only possible from a script written by people who are used to, you know, pastoring like the job where you do nothing and people leave money in a plate for you right. for, yes, for a little bit. Exactly. <laughs> I also just want to point out that the psychiatrist tries out defendant here and you can, <laughs> the other lawyer very clearly gets mad at him. He's like, that's my thing. I'm doing this that my in the movie. movie. Yeah. I'm, it's my, I'm doing, that's my bit. <laughs> so, yeah. So, but eventually at long last, Warden McBad lawyer says, uh, objection. What the fuck is any of this about? And the judge is like, no, that's a great, that's a really good objection. I'm surprised you didn't do that earlier. <laughs> Sorry. I was actually asleep. What, what happened in the movie? Yeah. So <laughs> All right, so so meanwhile, Rob Forster has tracked down the other guy who was there when the defendant supposedly roofied the woman when he was a Marine, right? Yeah, this is the script writing equivalent of introducing two sock puppets to fight each other to the mutual death <laughs> <laughs> in order to add eight minutes to your movie. <laughs> right, right. There's also this great moment. He shows up at the guy's house and he's like, Harry O'Ryan and the guy just bursts out of the door at a full run and he goes, don't run. I'm not a cop. And so he just stops. 
which means that the writer originally had a chase scene in mind and Robert Forster's like, fuck you. Fuck you. I'm 61. What the fuck are you talking about? Chase scene. <laughs> I also, I feel like the cop should try occasionally. No, don't run. I'm not a cop. And then you get up there and you're yeah. like, surprise. I actually, I am a cop. No, no I'm just headed to a costume party. <laughs> All right. I, I believe you. <laughs> So, yeah, so he's like, all right, I'll talk with you. We can have a scene. And he's like, all right, good, good that we can have a scene. And it turns out that it wasn't really Pete who roofied the the lady. It was actually Lieutenant Monroe who was the roofier in question. So the movie's story, and it's sticking with it, is that this (laughs) same guy has now twice been framed for roofying women. (laughs) He just has the worst luck. I guess, yes. Yeah. And Harry's like, I can't help you. I can't go back to that life as a character witness. And Bob's like, well, what if I give you a uplifting speech with some rising strings behind it? He's like, well, that might just do the trick. <laughs> you know what would have been nice for the audience would have been if Robert Forrester had asked the question, um, why exactly did you agree to throw, you know, your friend Pete under the bus? Like, oh, I see. Never mind. Got to read ahead again. The script demands that you suck on the stand in in about a half an act from now. Yeah. So. Who could possibly predict that the guy whose instinct was to run screaming from his house because a person knew his name would be a bad witness? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, oh, speaking of bad witnesses, so now we've got to get comic relief chewing tobacco guy on the stand, right? Now, Andrew, and this is important for our inevitable trial, are witnesses allowed to just blather on about whatever the fuck comes into their heads? (laughs) Only if they're the comic relief. That's a hard no. (laughs) That's a a negative (laughs) ghostwriter. Well, and and okay, so the, this is one of the f- few witnesses. He's like, was there a second car chasing the victim that night? And he's like, yep. And he's like, oh, that seems pretty fucking exculpatory. I guess we're going to ignore that from now on, too. Right. I'm, I'm sorry. This was the point in the script in which I wrote. Where the fuck in the trial are we? Right. Like, yeah. <laughs> usually you get cues like. You know, one side will call a witness. One side will be asking leading questions, right? Like, they're they're little hints that help you get through an episode of Matlock here. But, like, (laughs) since since nobody calls any fucking witnesses to the stand, nobody cross-examines anyone. Like, it's just like, I I don't know. People want to speak now. Yeah, right. (laughs) You get a witness, and then I get a witness, and then you get a witness. Well, no, because it's you get you use your surprise. It works like football timeouts. You can use your surprise witness within 15 minutes of the other guy's (laughs) first witness. I see. Tell us us more about how football timeouts work. Yeah, right, right. I damn damn it. The moment I I knew you were going to call that bluff, Andrew, how dare you? So, okay. So now Anne is on the stand, the, the psychiatrist, the jesus the psychiatrist. Again, she just magically appears up on the stand. But it does tell us that we are now clearly in the defense's side. Right? Yes, like, right. Yeah, that yeah. means the prosecution has rested, right? Which might be the kind of thing a law movie might, might want to show us. That, uh, sorry. Yeah. This is also genuinely the funniest, worst edit in the movie. <laughs> Her first statement is, Mr. Thompson is not a sociopath. And then it cuts to a shot of this actor looking like he's trying to blow something up with his mind. I have no idea. He's just like, oh, he looks like he's trying to shit into a water bottle without making a mess. Well, he's like, what tests have you performed? And she's like, all the ones that came up when the writer Googled psychiatric tests list. (laughs) Yeah. But also, like, also, sorry, Andrew, another legal question for you. Would you bring on a witness if the best thing that they could say about your client is, well, he's not a sociopath. I'm pretty sure of that. (laughs) (laughs) This 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 will matter for the future of this company, Andrew. (laughs) Answer carefully. I feel very confident I could find a better expert than that. All right. Good to know. And then, okay. So then she gets cross-examined and the entire cross-examination is Warden uh, Bad Lawyer going, you fucking Matthew Modine. I feel like you're fucking Matthew (laughs) Modine. You guys looked like you were fucking just (laughs) the best part. So, okay. Yeah. Right. This is unbelievably stupid cross X. Right. But then the objection, right. By Matthew Modine, right. He kind of looks at the judge and the judge and the judge's exact answer is, well, he's got her on cross. 
And I'm like, oh, good to know. So I can ask whatever the fuck I want on yeah. cross-examination. Apparently. Yeah, you know what they say. It's his turn to talk. <laughs> is, is this huh. the two of you eating peanut butter pie <laughs> together? Well, well, yeah. He's allowed to climb into the jury box and just go <laughs> vote guilty. <laughs> put, a, put a pin in that, Your Honor, because I got a whole lot of cross-examination yeah. coming up. You know? Right. Uh. All right. So now Harry, the character witness marine guy that's going to refute the other sock puppets testimony is he's on the stand now is he on the stand or are we all underneath a viaduct during monsoon season <laughs> yeah no it's like, very dramatically rainy out a lot of a lot of mm-hmm. punctual thunder <laughs> it, it is here. rainier in the foley than it was with that scene with matthew modine and Anne under an umbrella yes right like it is, yeah, no, this is, we're standing underneath the drain testimony. Sorry, I just want to set the scene properly. Right, for right, no. And so, and Harry says, no, it was the other guy that roofied the woman, and I just lied about it, no particular reason. And then Warden Mc, Bad Lawyer gets to cross-examine him. And he says, hey, man, do you, like, write bad checks every single day of your entire <laughs> adult life? And he's like, sure do. And he's like, all right, just wanted to clear that up. <laughs> yeah, he's written 137 bad checks at liquor stores. Yeah. What fucking liquor store takes a check? Hi, welcome to Gullible Gulps. Would you like to pay in promises and wishes today, or would you prefer the Discover card? <laughs> Yeah, but no, I wrote my notes. Holy the fuck, 137 bad checks. Who is still taking checks in 2010? <laughs> All right, well, I'll tell you what. Things are looking pretty bad for hard flips, so we're going to take a quick break to steal ourselves for the verdict. But first, let me give Act 3 the hard sell. Will Matthew Modine's clever lawyering save his client? Will the jury sentence beat to death? Will the defense's theory about the murder prove correct? No, on all three counts. <laughs> but keep listening anyway when we return for the holy fuck we've got to end this thing conclusion of The Trial. Now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Hi, I'm Andrew Torres. And I'm Eli Bosnick. As you can imagine, Eli tends to put people through a lot. Ooh, ooh, like the time I hid those speakers in the funeral home. <gasps> Right, right. Or the time that you uh, dyed the city water supply green. Yeah, that was for St. Paddy's Day. It was festive. The The point is, you don't need to be the subject of one of Eli's prank wars to need someone to talk to. And that's why there's BetterHelp. BetterHelp is online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat-only therapy sessions. So you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's affordable, financial aid is available, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Plus, I personally am in therapy, and obviously, I recommend it. Our listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash awful. That's BetterHelp.com slash awful. BetterHelp, because sometimes Eli hires a Batman actor to leap on you from a building. That was a gift. A gift to me. <sighs> <laughs> Now, Mr. Howell, can you confirm that you saw the defendant at the scene of the uh, crime? Objection, Your Honor. Hey, yes, Counselor. It's defendant. That's what I said, defendant. Defendant. That's that's clearly what he's saying. I, am I a fucking crazy person? Defendant, not defendant. Mr. Torres, if we can get back to the matter at hand. <sighs> Fine. Sorry. Anyways, as I was saying... Did you see the defendant at the scene of the crime? That's it. I quit. But but the defendant needs you. To- oh, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> it's important that you stay. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back for still more of this shit. We're going to open on the prison yard with Pete and Mac chatting eventually. <laughs> really, we just pan around like back away for like 18 minutes and then finally it lands on them and they're like, Mid conversation, mid conversation, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. I'll start talking now. Well, the camera's got us in frame. So this is also where where Mac tells Pete that he can't testify because he's an idiot. <laughs> this is such a meaningless thing to have in the script, right? Because Pete's like, ah, yeah, I can't wait until I get on the stand and I testify on my behalf. And Mac's like, yeah, no, that's not. <laughs> Dude, shut up. That's not <laughs> going to happen. Do that. But that. Like, there's never a reason for that guy because, like, you do that in a movie if eventually he's going to get on the stand and, and win the 
the jury over. But if he's just never going to take the stand, then why have this conversation at all? Yeah. But to be clear, you would never put him on the stand. Like, I don't care how sure. blonde and blue eyed he is. Right. <laughs> like this is this is the only good lawyer moment in the movie. Where Matthew <laughs> Benita is like, I'm going to put you on the stand and you're going to say, I don't remember anything, but I loved her. Like, eh, I don't know about that. Yeah. yeah. Right. This is also where I realized that this young man's version of acting is to look like someone just shat their pants and he's trying not to acknowledge it. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so so we cut back to the trial. Now, Alexander Hightower is taking the stand. This is the victim's dad, right? Why the fuck? Would, but, but anyway, so he's on the stand. Matthew Modine is like... He wanders in from the back, by the way. Sorry, yeah, I just yeah. have to talk about it because it's the craziest <laughs> thing. Ever. He just gets his own entrance. He, who knows how he even heard it? Apparently, he was listening with a glass to the door for his fucking cue in the trial. <laughs> yeah, right. He's the richest man in dog patch. He has a private entrance to the back of the courtroom. <laughs> Let's see why this is weird. No, that's fair. So, yeah, so he takes the stand and Matthew Modine is like, Please read this distressed email that I claim your daughter wrote about your pervy brother aloud for the jury. And he's like, well, I guess you asked me to do it. I have to do those things now. Yeah. Nice of him to do a dramatic reading, too. Oh, yeah. To sort of read. yeah. What's no, my he, motivation? He said he full on community theaters, this shit. And by the way, you don't need me to tell you, like, they do not need him to read this letter. It's hearsay either way, right? And the declarant is dead, right? She's the she's the victim. And uh, he can't authenticate it. He's never seen it. It's uh, also, it's more surprise evidence. Well, <laughs> right? <laughs> Each one more surprising than the last. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> literally, though. Literally yeah. in this case. <laughs> well, th that's right. I mean, they reverse admit the letter, right? Like, so he reads it first and then, and then you establish, you know, that, that lawyer thing you do where you're like, okay, you've seen this email before, right? And he's like, nope. And, and well, did, how do we know this isn't something Matthew Modine right. just wrote last night? Yeah. Can you confirm you saw my Breaking Bad guy holding a can of paint chimps earlier in the movie? It's important. <laughs> it's exactly the same thing. Oh. So, yeah, and, and so he says, yeah, no, that's a pretty disturbing email. And then bad guy lawyer gets up and he's like, okay, so just to be clear, that has nothing to do with anything happening in the case, correct? And then Mr. Hightower's <laughs> like, yeah, no, that is correct. Yeah. And then they bring on pervy uncle. This is the first time in the movie that we've seen this actor. Yeah. This is Spencer Hightower, right? Went to the Alex Jones School of Witnessing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy, didn't he? So, yeah. So he says he's like, you know what? I've got a creepy email for you to read as well. And he's like, oh, good. I was I've been practicing voices off. I was hoping you would have me do this, too. How amazing would it have been if he just because he's reading the email from her to him, what if he had read it in like a meh meh voice? Just, hey, meh meh, hello. I don't want to see you again. That's what she was like, trust me. She sounded like. <laughs> He's like, yeah, did you take $50,000 out of your trust two days before she died? And he goes like, yeah, I guess that is a relevant question that I will be required to answer for, for, by, the, <laughs> yeah. by the judge. He's like, damn right it is. Well, no, sorry. First he insults the jury and then he pisses off the judge and then he answers the question. <laughs> yes, yeah. I just have a tiny acting moment that I want to point out. So he he's sassy. And then the judge in the script slams his gavel and goes, you answer those questions. Except the actor is way too overzealous with his gavel and surprises everyone in the <laughs> yes. movie. He's like, bam! And everyone's like, whoa, what the <laughs> fuck was that? And he's like, sorry, I thought it was just a little wooden hammer. I didn't think it would make it. <laughs> <laughs> make such a loud noise. <laughs> fuck. Do we want to redo the? Oh, we're still keeping this right, shot. So All right. I guess <laughs> So and then he ends with this brilliant bit of lawyering. He says to Spencer Hightower, he's like, so is it is it true that you're actually the murderer? And he goes, no, I literally <laughs> word for word. The questions are, did you hire someone to kill her? No. Did you drug them? No. And, and, and I just have, well, shit, those questions always work on Matlock. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you do that? Well, then who did do it? I don't know, man. <laughs> What's happening right now in the movie? Uh, so now we have to have a moment. We're going to check in on all our characters and see what they're doing. We, we start with Pete, who's in the, the jail yard trying to, I guess, reenact the nuked playground dream sequence from Terminator <laughs> 2. 
Right. We just see him at the at the gate. there, looking pensively. We see Robert Forster. Now he's investigating. And what he's doing now, he's got his little paint chip. Right. And he's going to every single car in every single <laughs> used car lot in presumably Earth. Right. The world. <laughs> and holding his paint chip up to him going like, mm, is there this much paint missing anywhere on this car? <laughs> this is going to pay off for him eventually, believe it or not. We also... One more that I have, I have to point out. When we see Warden McBad lawyer, he's practicing a handshaking, isn't he? I, he is literally, <laughs> thank you. He's literally doing like a, okay, good. That one was good, but I'm going to give it an eight out of 10. Let's try it again, Jeffrey. <laughs> so, and of course, Hightower is, is drinking in his mahogany golf club and Mac is brooding in the, in the graveyard. Now it's time for their closing arguments, right? Oh, and... Matthew Modine's idea of what a closing argument is, is to reread the jury instructions as to what reasonable doubt means, because otherwise you will have forgotten that I got the only relevant piece of information back in Act 2 when their witness testified that my guy was incapacitated at the time that the girl was. But no, he decides not to bring up <laughs> nope. that piece of evidence because, you know, that would that would be inconsistent with the way the script is going to go. Also, so is there a dramatic lighting thing that they do in courts where it gets dimmer and dimmer as you get closer to the end of the trial, Andrew? <laughs> yeah, they actually let you hit a button and the lights lower okay, as you walk right, out yes. to do yeah, The whole <laughs> fucking thing is lit like a haunted house. <laughs> it's amazing. Also, Andrew, just real quick, is the definition of reasonable doubt if there's any chance he did do it, you have to say he's innocent. That's why that adjective reasonable does a lot of heavy lifting. <laughs> right? like, you hear Matthew Modine go, I eagerly await the day that Spencer Hightower is tried. And I'm like, what, the, the guy who answered no to your questions? Like, I don't. Like, we got zero evidence that he did anything. Right. I mean, ominous music, but, you know. Yeah, yeah there was ominous music. Also, you're supposed to add a little roast of the other lawyer at the end of your closing statement, <laughs> right? Just a reminder, he was the warden in Shawshank Redemption. He was the bad guy. Always so. the bad guys. <laughs> and then, okay, he gets up to do his closing statement there's just this amazingly weird moment where we, we truly learn how lazy this writer is right where he starts explaining what a red herring is and every single detail he gives is wrong <laughs> it's it's insane it's 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 the i literally i never do this i got anna i was like anna you have to watch this and confirm that this exists in the universe have you ever heard this and she was like no of course not this isn't what it is he's like is what a red herring is it's a fish that distracts other fish from eating its babies. That's why they call distractions red herring. Okay, so I don't blame anyone for not knowing the origin of this fucking phrase, right? It's a kind of a weird one. But to be clear, a red herring isn't a type of herring out in the wild that is red. <laughs> they turn red when you smoke them. And the reason that a red herring means something meant to distract you is because you can use them to, like, throw the scent of, like, dogs that are following something off, right? That's the idea. You drag a, a red herring along the ground and the, and the dog will follow that instead of, you know, the criminal that just broke out, whatever. That's the origin of the phrase. So... Why have the guy even try to throw something out there if you don't know what the origin of the goddamn <laughs> phrase is? You know what I bet that means is what yeah. we got from this writer. <laughs> yep. I, I kind of feel like Lindsey Graham was like, hey, man, I was in Shawshank. So uh, I get <laughs> I'm not and, looking and, shit up. For and you. Get, you know, he started off the negotiations with, uh, OK, so I get I get to chew the scenery in at least one scene. I got this great bit about herrings and it totally <laughs> kills. I promise. Yeah. Also, he ends his thing by very solemnly raising the actress who's supposed to be Amanda's headshot. <laughs> the murder, like her, the victim, her acting yeah. headshot. Yeah. Yes. I really wanted a flash cut of him printing that out at Staples. This is for a very important end of closing statement dramatic moment. So make sure you put the little headshot border in her resume. On the back. <laughs> and OK. And then so he finishes up his his closing statement. And then the judge turns to the jury and says, uh, have a decision to me by Monday. I guess I just. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You both know that my notes here just say, wait, what the actual fuck. <laughs> but, but here's the thing. When 
the closing statements are done, the jurors go deliberate in that jury room, right? They don't go home for the weekend to like watch the news and, you know, <laughs> chat with their neighbors and otherwise contaminate the whole fucking trial. Like, uh, so yes. you, you, they don't usually like compare schedules with the judge to see when a fucking verdict yeah, works right. for no, them. So, you know, Friday yeah. night is going to be terrible for me, guys. Oh. I'm going to have a kid's. I have bingo on Tuesdays. <laughs> Can we do next Thursday for the murder verdicts? So, all right, so 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 we cut to Mac and Mindy wondering how Act Three is going to play out, <laughs> and then we skip straight to the jury announcing their decision. So there was no reason for the judge to adjourn until Monday. He could have just said, "Okay, now go deliberate," and we could imagine that this just happens, you know, forty minutes later or something. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I can't allow you to pass over what what. Mac and Mindy oh, right. are, are discussing for the strategy. Oh, yes, of course. Yeah, the all I need is one, and that will hang the jury. And, uh, you know, I'm going to just go on a, on a little bit on a limb here. Do take this one and only one piece of legal advice from this podcast. If your criminal lawyer's strategy is to hope that one guy is going to hold out and be a hung jury, then you should get a new lawyer. Okay? <laughs> Especially when he has uh, the fucking toxicologist guy give like completely exculpatory evidence in that trial. Uh, yeah. Unbelievable. So, okay. So now it's time for the verdict. Don't worry. There's still like 23 minutes left in the movie. So, it's not going to be not guilty, right? They, they, <laughs> they stand up and they're like, we find the defendant guilty, but at least we pronounce defendant normally. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> hey, Andrew, is there more trial after the end of the trial? Um, there actually yeah, is in a, uh, in, in a capital case, right? So you would come back and then argue whether he gets the death penalty or not. Not oh. that you would know that from this movie no. where you come back and Matthew Modine uses that time to treat the jury as free therapy. <laughs> <laughs> he totally does. Yeah. So, okay. But now, yeah, the, he's the kid is guilty and they're going to come back the next day or the following Monday, whatever, and do the sentencing. So Matthew Modine needs to walk off and be sad for a while. Oh, my God. If he went home and shot himself, followed by the credits, this would be my favorite <laughs> oh, fucking Christ. movie. <laughs> well, fuck, I should have just killed myself at the beginning. This would have turned out the same either way. They would have had to have paid for the royalties to use the sad walkie away music from the Bill Bixby Incredible Hulk. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, he needed yeah. that in this moment. So, OK, by the way, this is also, he goes back to the headstones, which we've seen a number of times in this movie, him standing over the, the headstones of his of his dead family. This is the first time we back that shot up enough to realize that those are not in a graveyard. Just that's the tree behind his house. Apparently, step creep me the fuck out. It's it's the it's the dog leg par four at Mar-a-Lago. Yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to bear. Can I bury my son and my wife on my house in my backyard? I mean, I guess, man. We good. Stop you. I'm going to need it for moping. Yep. So, so, yeah, it cuts down on a lot of uh, commute time in his mope. Yeah. So, okay. So, but then he goes to visit Anne, the psychiatrist, and he's like, I know you barely in the movie, but I, you're the love interest. It was clear from Warden McBad lawyer's testimony. You are the love interest. She says, I am the love interest. Yeah. So, so they talk about their grief and Jesus. Yeah. And God has a reason for your grief. Yeah. Really wanted to cut to that conversation in heaven. God smoking a cigarette. All right, we got to kill this guy's wife and kid because I got a meth head who's going to get in a car crash in a couple of weeks and I need him <laughs> to get him off. So no, I have no other solutions for this. And talk about a weak ass apologetic for the problem of evil here. She says, you know, you've been so busy being mad at God for killing your family that you forgot to thank him for not killing you too. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> which I'd love it if that became his strategy legally, right? He goes back to the court. And he's like, think about all the other people my client didn't kill, right? Let's <laughs> thank him for that a little bit. <laughs> but no, instead he goes home and he cries over some photographs. Yeah. And then we cut to the sentencing, which is apparently done in dramatic monologue form. <laughs> this is the weirdest thing in the fucking world because for no discernible reason before or after he starts explaining to the jury that when he got this case, he was suicidal. Just not a thing you can do. No, absolutely. <laughs> Look, there is very little that is prohibited in your closing argument, but 
personal advocacy and stories is one of those things. Yeah. Hey, everybody. My name is Andrew. I interviewed this fucking Green Party motherfucker on my podcast. <laughs> week. Let me tell you. I mean, he seems like a nice guy, but when you drill down on what he's saying, it's so full of shit. Anyways, get Eli off for stealing that moped. What do you yes, say? Yeah. Huh? <laughs> yeah. So he says, I was suicidal. And if you can pick my client, wow, well, that might just push me over the edge. Anyway, as you're deciding <laughs> whether or not to convict my client and send him to the to the electric chair or whatever, I want you to consider one word. Just one word. It's an ordinary word, so I crossed <laughs> deliquescent and synecdoche off of my list or whatever. <laughs> I was really rooting for oopsie. <laughs> <laughs> but no, the word is life. He goes, life is the word I want you to consider. You know, we live in a world where life is cheap. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is about to turn into an anti-abortion rant, isn't it? <laughs> and I'm sitting here thinking this is the penalty phase for your client who was convicted of having killed somebody. Word, yes. Like, maybe maybe not point out that, like, we have a culture of life being cheap because they're going to be like, hmm, wonder who helped perpetrate that culture. The uh, murdery McMurderer over there. Right. Yeah, exactly. So he says, but life is a gift from God, Noah. It counts. It counts. <laughs> this movie counts. And then they, they send him away. Then we, we get this charming little scene where Mindy bought Mac a cell phone as a, you know, let's hope you don't get your client killed present. <laughs> I guess. Such a weird tonal shift of like, uh, and as I stare down the barrel of the gun, I think I'll go for a walk outside. <laughs> you can play games on it. I just, during the uh, the other guy's closing argument, he's just super playing Angry Birds. Guys, have you seen these? These are fucking sweet. I'm on like level 17 of Candy Crush. Will you guys friend me and give me sprinkly balls? <laughs> so, okay. But now the jury has reached their sentencing decision, right? So we go back in and we replay that other scene, but they're not going to send him to the electric chair. They've decided to give him a life sentence with a possibility of parole. And we're all writing in our notes like, wait, who won? And would, and movie wise, is that a win for Matt? Yeah. Did he is that a partial Q, Q walking on sunshine? Yeah. Baby. <laughs> <laughs> now, let me just say credit where credit is due. Warden McBad guy lawyer leans over with a fucking sick ass burn here. He's like, hey, man, um, I'm really glad you didn't kill yourself because then I wouldn't have fucking won <laughs> so hard. <laughs> Face. <laughs> Goodbye from the movie. <laughs> All right. So, OK, then we cut to Max's office. It's open once again. He had closed it in his depression, but now he's lawyering again. Yeah, this is the lesson. If the movie ends right here, the lesson is. Get your client convicted, sentenced to life in prison, and your life will turn out just fine. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. You still get your 600 bucks and everything. <laughs> oh, man. So, but then, so Mindy comes and she's like, hey, you know, I thought I found something very interesting about Pete's case. And he's like, yeah, I am still interested in that for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> Question. He then says, let's subpoena the doctor, the bad doctor guy. And I was like, as your role as people who were lawyers once, yeah. are, there, are subpoenas things that you could just fire out of a T-shirt cannon? And <laughs> <laughs> they, they are clearly part of the lawyer's inherent power, according to this movie. Even like baby Aaron Gray, like she goes to deliver it to Dr. Evil Scumbag. And she says it's from Mac McLean, right? Matthew Modine's character's name, because... There isn't an open case that it could actually be from. Yeah. <laughs> yes. just, you're playing go fish with Andrew. He just hands you a subpoena. Yeah. Shit. Okay. I do have twos. <laughs> I have twos if you want to ask for twos. <laughs> I hate when you use your lawyer powers to in game <laughs> night. <laughs> It'll be on orange paper too. Like, all oh, yeah, night. of course, obviously. But yeah, but she's discovered that the evil psychiatrist slash financial advisor is the president of five different companies that Spencer Hightower owns. Uh -huh. Right. And they have to subpoena the records for all of those because. I don't know. Yeah. Right. Because his niece got murdered. I die. Yeah. <laughs> I do this shit for a living. And even I was bored <laughs> at this. Like, oh, uh, yeah. Alex Jones's lawyers are watching this movie going, it's fucking stupid. Man. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so meanwhile, Bob Forster's still out there comparing his paint chip to literally every used car for sale <laughs> anywhere in the southeastern United States. And what do you know? He finds a match. Yep, just uh, after the trial has ended. Yeah, great, great timing there, Bob. Yeah, p- plus the the car dealer here is, you know, poor man's Kevin Klein. And mm-hmm. oh, so literally, I'm sorry, I'm checked out for the rest of this movie because all I can think of is how great a fish called Wanda is. So right? Sure, <laughs> sure, get to your happy place. Yeah. Who can blame you? Yeah. I'm just muttering like Aristotle was not Belgian under my breath. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so... I I love this because his detective trick here, Breaking Bad Guy's detective trick here is, hey, I'll buy this car, but only if I can gently kiss the previous owner on the mouth. <laughs> and the fucking car dealer is like, yep, that's definitely a thing. Used cars, mail salesman are allowed to do. I will do that for you because I sure can. I will tell you exactly where he lives. Go detect him. I'll give you an address and then you come back and buy the car. Yep. But wait, wait, wait. Before you go, pinky promise. Yes. Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> But this scene, this scene isn't just pointless, right? It is a deliberate, malicious cucumber order level. Fuck you to all of us for watching it, right? Because the paint chips, red herring, the car, red herring, Spencer Hightower being, you know, super pervy and wanting to fuck his niece, red herring. Like it's red herrings all the way down. Yeah, it really is. So he fall, he goes to this address. And of course, as he's walking up, he hears. Doc Newburn, the, the psychiatrist, financial advisor, walking out of that house in that moment going, why, we're going to bad guy some more. We are the true <laughs> villains in this film. I am the, believe it or not, if you've been following along with this movie, this might be hard to believe. <laughs> but I'm the bad guy and my motivations are, let me just say it, bananas. <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, so, but do, the, the doctor's been subpoenaed, so he has to that day bring his records to Matthew Modine's office, right? Yeah, it's, it's one of those one day subpoenas. Yeah, is it right? Well, it's a <laughs> partial day. FedEx, partial day. Yeah, FedEx guarantees you get it later that same day or it's free. Yeah. <laughs> so, <sighs> so he brings by his, his files and he's like, hey, man, I'm just here to bring all of this, uh, this uh, incriminating evidence. Can I have a moment alone with your beverage? <laughs> yeah, he goes, he, he brings him the papers and he's like, do you have any more coffee? And he's like, oh, yeah, I do. And he's like, Le- leave the room, though. <laughs> <laughs> but don't take your don't take your coffee with. God damn it. I've literally watched botched proposals go better than this. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So and, and, and of course, we get Bob following the bad guys from the car seller house intercut with this. And he goes like um, Matthew Modine goes, look, man, we've got like six minutes left in this movie or so could you want to just monologue about the master plan you're clearly the bad guy now he's like yeah no i've already roofied you so that'll be fine i can tell you all about (laughs) it (laughs) this is where the laughter turned into just tears of delight because i had no the first time through i had no idea where this was going like matthew modine was roofied and like slumps out of his chair and then and, and it cannot be stressed enough like Dr. McBad guy here is uh, 70 and I'm going to say 285 pounds, right? Yeah. This mm-hmm. is, I'm going, oh God, are we going to get a recreation of Tom Cruise beating the shit out of Wilford Brimley? And, <laughs> but oh, but yeah. if Tom Cruise was roofied at the time, yes. Well, and, and that's the thing is, I did not, I honestly expected, I swear to God, I expected that this movie was going to have Matthew Modine say, See, I knew you were going to roofie me with that whole thing. So I've been slowly building up my immunity to rope it all. <laughs> I'll have the princess bride and Iocane powder, you know. But both of the cups were roofied. Uh, oh, that would have been so much better. <laughs> Ah, but no, instead they just kind of have roofies on Matthew Modine, just kind of make him try and shoot you in the dick. I don't know. Yeah. You explain the end of this scene to me. At one point as the doc is like, oh, are you feeling dizzy? Is your 
judgment impaired. I want to be like, how do you feel about Bitcoin as an investment? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then like his his new cell phone rings and the and the doctor's like, damn it, I didn't think he had a cell phone. He didn't in act two. So they wrestle for it. And what I'm sure the writer assumed would be dramatic and actiony. But again, it's a 70 year old overweight guy wrestling with a drugged guy. And it <laughs> looks like that instead. <laughs> yeah. It's the kind of thing you'd take your phone out to film, but wouldn't put in a movie. It's yeah. a very specific kink. Yeah, <laughs> let's just leave it at that. So, yeah, so but but he grabs the phone and he throws it away. The, the bad guy does. But just then, Matthew Modine grabs his suicide gun. And the, and the dude goes, whoa, what are you going to do with that? Yeah, and, and the answer is shoot you. <laughs> you <laughs> yes, as it turns out. <laughs> to be fair. If Matthew Modine had just started to fillet the gun, like, yeah, <laughs> now I made it weird. <laughs> that also probably would have saved his life. Yeah. So, but yeah, but he shoots him. He kneecaps the motherfucker, right? Uh, it, mm -hmm. it, but again, we do not know it is kneecaps until like two scenes from now. What we see is Matthew Modine point the gun at Dr. Evil's face and then lower it yes. a la RoboCop. And it's like, all right, we know what's coming next. Yeah, right, right. But yeah, and then, of course, Robert Forster's like, well, I get to beat somebody up, right? And they're like, yeah, you can beat up the goons who are waiting outside. So he beats up the goons that are waiting outside and runs in and, and saves the day. Sorry, I just have to clarify. I know it doesn't matter, and I know it's the stupidest thing ever, but if I have to know it, so does our audience. To be clear, the plot of this movie is that the psychiatrist was embezzling from the trust of the girl who got murdered and then murdered her because when she dies, the trust pays out 50 grand. Well, so so when she dies, the the other surviving members who are part of the trust get her money. Right. So and then he was going to kill everybody except for Spencer that was part of the trust. And then he was going to steal Spencer's money. That was the stupid fucking plot of the stupid fucking His movie. His plan was a tauntine, a one man <laughs> tauntine. Yes. Uh, and also his plan for killing Matthew Modine was to roofie him and then force feed him alcohol and then dump his body into the water. So everybody would think that he roofied himself and then got drunk and then drowned himself. Oh, this guy, you know what? He was just in a trial all about roofies. I bet he did this for like an <laughs> ironic, dramatic, right, ironic yes. purposes. <laughs> right. So, yeah. So, but then we get the the quick aftermath scene where all the first responders are there. Like, they're, they're like, here's, here's, um, I don't know, anti roofies or whatever. We need you to be conscious in the next scene. <laughs> so, are there anti roofies? I'm I, don't, just, I don't think there are anti roofies. Okay. So, okay. And then we get the, the warden meeting with, Alexander Hightower and explaining the whole convoluted dumbass plot just in case grandma didn't get it through the series of reveals, right? Alex looks at Warden McBad Lawyer at the end of that and he goes, wow, that's not uh, <laughs> not very satisfying at all in terms of plot. Like, that's crazy. <laughs> what the fuck are they possibly going to call this movie? I don't know, man. I mean, there was a trial. <laughs> <laughs> <So> <laughs> and then Pete gets out of jail and Matt goes to the support group and becomes a Christian. So Pete 100% does not get out of jail. This is 2010, right? We are in Antonin Scalia's America at this point, and actual innocence is not a basis for a habeas petition. Oh, yeah. you're right. So, uh, no, this is the movie. Sadly, everybody is happy except Pete, who gets to also serve 25 years. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> life. No, life. That was right. Yeah. Yeah, no, life with the possibility of of parole yeah so okay and then and a, we see that he's gone to the support group to be all christian and then the movie closes with him going into an empty courtroom and sort of smiling to himself and going yep lawyer who's <laughs> 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 yeah. got two thumbs and sucks at closing arguments <laughs> <laughs> so, all right so one final legal question for you to close things off Andrew, I think it's it's going to be it's a fairly obvious one. Do you periodically walk around empty courtrooms and nod proudly at the fact that you're a lawyer? And if not, would you like to learn more about our Lord and Savior Jesus of Nazareth? <laughs> Ooh, interesting. So who? How, uh, yes, I would desire to learn more about this. Uh, hey, Jesus, of whom you speak, <laughs> I, I, in finest Christian apologetics fashion, I, a white male professional in the United States, have of course never heard of it. Yeah, right, right. Uh huh. The, the, their dream come true well andrew thanks again so much for hanging out with us pretty sure we'd have been able to catch a few legal flubs 
without you on this one even. Be interesting. If you, if you can imagine that. <laughs> but glad to have you here nonetheless. And while that does it for our review of the trial, that's not going to do it for the episode just yet because we still need to lure ourselves back into this perpetual trap. So, Eli, tell us what's on deck. Well, Noah, I've been looking forward to this one for a really long time. And if the IMDb description doesn't tell you why, nothing will. Quote, a secondhand report of a man vomiting after eating chicken leads a preacher to believe a vampire is afoot. What? Luckily for the guy, his girlfriend has AIDS, which allows him to be spared. What? We'll be watching <laughs> The Last Vampire on Earth. <laughs> Holy what? fucking shit. Well, luckily is doing a lot of heavy lifting <laughs> of that sentence there. Anyway. <laughs> All right, so with that to look forward to, we're going to bring episode 366 to a merciful close. Once again, a huge thanks to Andrew, whose shows you'll find linked on the show notes if you want to hear more from him, and trust me, you do. And perhaps even huger thanks to all the Patreon donors that help make the show go. If you'd like to count yourself among their ranks, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash godawful and thereby earn early access to an ad-free version of every episode. You can also help us out a ton by leaving a five-star review and by sharing the show on all your various social media platforms. And if you enjoyed this show, be sure to check out our sibling shows, The Scathing A, The Citation Data, d and Minus, and The Skeptocrat, available wherever podcasts live. If you have questions, comments, or cinematic suggestions, you can email godawfulmovies at gmail.com. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Hey, that's that guy. Tim Robertson takes care of all our social media. Our theme song was written and performed by Orion Slotnick of Evil Drafts on Mars. All the other music was written and performed by our audio engineer, Morgan Clark, and was used with permission. Thanks again for giving us a chunk of your life this week. For Heath Enright and Eli Bosnick, I'm No Illusions. Promise to work hard to earn another chunk next week. Until then, we'll leave you with the Breakfast Club close. Lindsey Graham called a bunch of Republicans in Georgia and tried to convince them to overturn the 2020 election. And now he has to testify before Fonnie Willis's grand jury. <laughs> <laughs> Unrelated, but yeah, I'm glad you, glad you added it. Lindsey Graham also probably roofied some motherfuckers and stole money from a family trust while we're on the subject. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Every single actor in this movie has deleted it from their memory. <laughs> <laughs> I bet Nikki DeLoach has it. No, it's just the poster. <laughs> oh, this? <laughs> just a little film I did with my good friend Matthew Modine. Matt, I call him. <laughs> the preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2022. All rights reserved. Abuelita, my father, my whole family, and Grand Canyon University made me the man I am today. Hi, Tia. Hola. I think I'm going to do Grand Canyon University's online program and get my master's degree. Trata de llevar a tu familia en el corazón y lograrás lo que tú quieres. Estoy muy orgullosa de ti. I uh, have an announcement to make, so I'm going to get my master's degree online at Grand Canyon University. <gasps> Find your purpose at GCU. Progressive presents Don't Do It Yourself. Okay, simple enough. Just got to get in there with my screwdriver. Do you mind handing me my screwdriver? Are you trying to say screwdriver? Well, I mean, you're saying...